Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank welcome you. Welcome back. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for um, joining. Yes. Welcome our next uh, speaker, Felix. He will talk to you about the common language, so customer service versus product people. And uh, without further ado, take it away and welcome Felix in the chat. If you have any questions, post them there as well. Felix, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone, for joining my little TED Talk. So to start with, I would like everyone to look at this picture or even close your eyes and imagine the perfect uh, workspace. And it's the perfect workspace because engineers, product people, and customer care people are on the same page. They actually know exactly what's happening, when it's happening, and why it's happening. And they are using each other's knowledge and the historical knowledge and what's happening between customers uh, and the products, and they share it. And it's used for investigations. And it's also used this perfect world to um, raise bugs and issues and feature requests and solve them quickly. It's a completely customer-centered company that we're imagining here. And uh, that's uh, leading to a constant stream of feedback from customers and uh, a totally high adoption rate of your products and of satisfaction rates and of your NPS. It's a, always a 10 out of 10. Maybe it's a nine sometimes when there's a full moon. So very happy place, right? Now go back to reality. We're not all there yet. So why am I talking here? So mostly because my boss asked me to. Hi, Micha. Uh, hope you're watching. And secondly, there are a few things that I might be able to share when it comes to customer service and customer care. My story all started when I was 16 in a travel agency. I wanted to work there because I wanted to travel, go places, see some nice beaches. When I started there, my boss always told us, you have the best job. You are covering the best five weeks of our customers' year. After a few years, uh, I started at HomeGate as head of customer care. And then I realized, hey, this is very similar. We are now responsible for 52 best weeks of our customers. And that's the place where they live and where their home is and now also where we're working at. And um, what changed was a little bit how we interacted with our customers. So before in a travel agency, you have these glossy um, catalogs with nice pictures of hotels and pools and all that stuff. And at HomeGate, you have listings. And most of the time, those listings have a picture of a toilet with an open toilet seat. But what also changed was the environment where we did our customer care. And that's the digital world. And with digital, there comes uh, new topics such as engineering, IT, tools, bugs, product people, MVPs, backlogs, all that jazz. I speak five languages, but I don't speak agile, or at least back at, in the days. So what I then discovered was uh, what this topic was all about that we sometimes don't have a common language between customer care and product people. Let me give you some examples. Um, when you say MVP, then I said, it's buggy, it's incomplete. When you said, we need to prioritize that ticket, then I was like, well, then do so and fix it. And also um, when you said, we're gonna release this morning, then I was like, why the hell didn't you tell me that? earlier. This all leads to unhappiness. And unhappiness is therefore because unhappy customers are creating unhappy customer care agents, which leads me to fill your backlog with issues and then slacking you and then emailing you about those issues in your backlog, leading me to walk over to your table and asking you to fix it. This is disruptive. Uh, it's unproductive and it's waste. So there's one main major thing we are forgetting in this process when it comes to unhappiness. It's the customer in the end. So let me give you a short example out of my experience from a situation that escalated quickly. Um, we introduced a new importer 
that made our publication process um, faster. So from one hour down to three minutes. Um, it was an old system that got replaced and uh, it caused um, a lot of edge cases to be forgotten about, um, also because customer care wasn't involved early in stage uh, to show these edge cases. And in the end, a lot of custom requests and complaints piled up and in their backlog because they asked us to open up a Jira ticket for every single case. These Jira tickets didn't really progress. So what happened exactly that I started to slack people, uh, go over to that day table. I even asked engineers directly to fix something because I knew it's only taking five minutes, especially on a Friday. And um, in the end, it got so bad that I created a wall of shame. I wrote every single ticket and the cause and the issue of it on big papers. I taped them on, onto the window, called it the wall of shame. And um, I know it's very passive aggressive, but in the end, it somehow worked out. People shifted their priorities a little bit. Some things got changed. And I thought there must be a better way to go around that. And through the years, uh, I discovered a few topics that I wanted to share with you that might improve the communication between you and customer care. First of all, it's time. Involve customer people uh, as soon as you can, as early as you can, in your investigations, in your MVP sessions, maybe, and update them regularly. Regular involvement and early involvement enables customer care, care agents to actually prepare themselves, get a lot of questions done, um, talk about all the edge, edge cases that there are. And in the end, when you're launching your product, this leads to a professional customer service because people actually can answer what this is about, this new product. Also, when you start early, there might be even a chance that you can optimize uh, some, some manual process that's currently there. And then you have a win-win situation for both parts. The next thing is try to channel the communication streams. Um, try to find flexible ways. It's not always the same one for every product. But what for me worked well was having a dedicated product Slack channel where all people involved can post questions and feedbacks from customers. But it's important that also you get a reaction out of that Slack channel. The good thing is once your product is safe and it's working um, normally as you expect, then you always can close down this Slack channel because it's not needed anymore. Also try um, to separate in this communication stream and channel box from free feature requests. In customer care, it's sometimes not that easy to make the difference between a bug and a feature request. Help them, guide them to find the difference and also help them in the prioritization. For example, sometimes it's, um, it's best solved to get a feature request done instead of free bugs. You might have uh, more time gained and a better adaptation of the product in this case. Um, Always keep in mind, you're not possibly the only product person to be in contact with customer care. So keep the communication as easy and slick as possible. Because when you have too many templates and too many channels and too many Confluence pages, you get lost in there in the daily work. Next, language. It's a fact. We, as customer care people, don't speak necessarily the same language as you product people do. Customer people often talk about products like the customer talks about the product, whereas product people always talk about the journey and the implementation and maybe the systems that are connected to it. So try to stop the bullshit bingo about the exact terminology and try to find a language where you both feel comfortable and understand what it's about for this product and for the next product. But there is a warning in it that's important. An easy language doesn't mean dumb. These people are not dumb. Remember, I speak five languages, but every new language needs time to learn and to adapt and to make it easy to use. You might be surprised how fast uh, you can meet in the middle. And finally, trust. I know it's a little bit uh, a word that's used a lot uh, and may maybe mostly in the wrong areas, but trust customer care people when they raise a topic. In customer service, you, you develop a feeling, a gut feeling when something goes wrong. 
Remember, not all customers always raise an issue with your product. They, seem, they might sometimes just like walk away not using it. So what we see is the tip of the iceberg. So sometimes that tip is only about three or four um, requests that come in a very short time after each other. So you, you try to see a pattern and then you want to share that with the product people and the engineers to maybe raise an issue. What's not the best way to do in that case is ask them about how many cases you have. So four, three or four cases um, is not a lot to shift your priority, but it's maybe enough to investigate and find the correct data together and find the right ways of measuring it so that you can then start to prioritize if this is really an issue or not. I have a secret for you guys and it helped me, but also a lot of product people when interacting with customer care uh, people and agents. No is a valid answer. I tell you why. In, uh, after each customer case and complaint and chira ticket is often a customer waiting for a reply. No is a valid reply to a customer. Are you fixing this issue within the next 24 hours? Yes or no? No enables you to tell them, I'm sorry, we will come back to you on Monday. Is this feature coming soon, this week, next week, in a month? Yes or no? No enables customer care to go back to the customer and try to find a solution with the existing solutions. So again, no is a valid answer and it helps both sides. So to bring this topic around, and maybe I'm a finishing a little bit early, but that leaves us with um, some, some questions. We can get to this place that we imagined in the beginning. Uh, we can do it together because now I'm a product person myself since this year. So everything is possible. And what I can give you on the way is that you will find the common language between customer care and product if you focus on what the customer actually needs. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you so much, Felix, for this really, really interesting talk. Uh, we have one question just coming up from Thomas in the chat. Um, I'll read it to you. Could you achieve that customers bring in value feedback instead of raising very simple questions? Uh, an example is where can I upload my logo or just bugs? Yes, I mean, like there, there are several ways like how you can integrate that. So one is, of course, it depends a little bit on what customers you have. For example, with business customers, you can create direct interviews and, and try to find out about their ways of working and issues. Um, private customers, for example, how we use them with, with HomeGate is a little bit more, more um, difficult. Uh, it helps if you try to channel with tags and topics within the customer service that they, they can sort somehow the requests and then you can regularly visit those, those data sets. Or simply as on consumer websites, like all, all the hot jar possibilities, for example, that you can generate and then they're able to give the feedback directly instead of having a complaint. Yeah, thanks. Um, another question that came up was uh, why it's a bad question to ask for a quantification of the feedback you receive. It's, it's not bad, it's difficult. Um, remember, as I said, like sometimes you just start seeing a pattern and it's, kind of, uh, it's, it's about certain numbers that raise from one day to the other. Like, for example, after release, then you realize like you, you, you're going to see some patterns of the same weird um, error that's, that's, that's coming up. Um, and when you have this one day and maybe the next day and you have like these 10 or 20 cases out of maybe 100 that you regularly have within a topic, that doesn't seem like a lot to most product people, but it's a lot when you just release something. And um, that's why I say quantification is difficult uh, when you just have these one cases, because it could be one private customer there, one private customer over there, but it could be like a thousand that simply just didn't get back to you. 
and we 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 in customer care we don't know that if it's a thousand or a hundred yeah yeah uh, as a as a user researcher i think i i understand where this comes from uh, i also read a, a comment that uh, people are are loving the the part of saying no um <laughs> so I, I I actually invented that one because like I had to force in my role as customer care head of customer care I always had to force them be brave and tell me no I'm I can deal no <laughs> it's even better nice cool um let me check if I find another question so um there is one more um where Thomas asks if you have come up with a system that consolidates feedback in a more structured way. No, um, we we use Salesforce for uh, our customer care center with their case management, and there is the possibility to segment. So it's like tagging something. The issue is the more granular you get, the longer a customer care agent has to actually identify the tag, and also the less precise it gets. But that you also can say, like, if they're very uh, high level, those topics, it's also on, on precise. So no, I haven't found the best way actually to do so. I think, as I said, like, if you have product channels for something you're just releasing, I guess this is re really in, in ways something that worked out the best because it's very direct feedback from customer care into a channel about the product that just got launched instead of collecting it with some tags and then delivering the data weekly or monthly. Yeah, definitely uh, sounds like a, a good approach to try. Um, there is two more questions, but I think they relate to each other. So um, I'll read them together. It's, uh, do you have a shared list of requests that product people can pick out from uh, to prioritize new improvements? And then within that process, who takes the final decision? Um. As I said, we're not in a perfect world yet. So no, not always. Um, it depends a little bit on the product and on the product manager. I know, or I, I've been myself in situations and now my, my successor is also in situations like that where this exists, yes. Um, so in that case, it makes sense. Uh, and it, there it's very important to channel away from feature requests and bugs and what's happening right now about your product. Um, and then try to find the prioritization. Um, prioritization, again, sometimes not in numbers. Maybe you can find another metric that's making it easier to follow in that prioritization. So like a, a, a green, red, yellow, uh, like the traffic light systems, or uh, next, first, now. Um, I also was once involved in a backlog and trying to prioritize within a backlog. That's, in my opinion, not the best way. A separate list could be working, but as I said, it's really depending a little bit on the project or product that's that's generated right now. If it's just a feature, maybe that's all not needed. If you're replacing a whole system, I think it's a good idea. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the awesome talk again and the the question, uh, the answers to all the questions. Um, Thank you all for questions. And yeah, maybe uh, some more will pop up in the chat. Uh, feel free to answer them there. And the uh, audience, feel free to um, post some more in there. Uh, great discussion. And see you in a few minutes for the next talk. Bye. Cool. Bye, guys.